It's a joy to have you back after the break. The cookies and donuts will put you to sleep, but the coffee will wake you up, right? Again, it's a joy to have you here with us at our 15th Bible Prophecy Conference. And uh, appreciate Tommy Ice's subject on the rapture, and he's going to continue that the, this afternoon. And he'll be speaking tomorrow morning also, for those of you who can stick around. Uh, incidentally, tonight, a very special feature, Bill Federer is going to be speaking uh, later this morning, but this evening, he'll, we have a special session with him also. Now we have a, a wonderful speaker, Don Perkins. Uh, he, he's been with us in the past. A couple years ago, we had our conference and had things filled and had uh, the speakers ready to fly in, and uh, COVID hit. And so we had to shift to live stream. So we had Don Perkins live stream and also Bill Federer uh, live stream. But we're glad that we have them with us live and in person today. Uh, Don is founder of According to Bible Prophecy Ministry, According to Prophecy Ministries. And he's devoted nearly 30 years. Now it's more than that. This is an old introduction here. The study of God's Word with the focus of Bible prophecy. Don travels extensively speaking on Bible prophecy at conferences, seminars, Bible studies, and local churches. He's also a contributing author, along with several other Bible scholars, in the Dictionary of Premillennial Theology, produced by Kriegel. Do you have that out there in your bookstore? No? Is it out of print? Okay. Well, we'll get it back in print. He's appeared on near, numerous TV programs. Perhaps you've seen him on his channel with uh, Tom Hughes and, and others on Thursday nights. Incidentally, every Thursday night, uh, 9 o'clock our time, they're on. And it, it's a wonderful program. We'll get you some more information on that. Anyway, it's a privilege to introduce to you uh, Don Perkins and his lovely wife, wife is with him, tending his book ministry. So say something about you. Thank you, sir. Well, I greet you in the wonderful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and truly it's a privilege uh, and an honor to be here. Uh, I don't take for granted the opportunity to come and stand before God's people. Uh, looking forward to a wonderful time. Uh, I'm going to mention a few materials that we have uh, at the book table there. Uh, this is a wonderful book entitled uh, Exploring Bible Prophecy from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, this is by the late uh, Dr. Uh, Tim LaHaye and now the late Dr. Ed Heinsohn. Uh, I love this book because it, it covers every prophecy in the scriptures. And again, it's a wonderful study there. Here's another book. It's entitled Prophecy for Young People. You know, I'm in a lot of conferences, and, uh, you know, I, I challenge parents and grandparents to teach your little ones Bible prophecy. Some of the hardest questions I get, believe it or not, is from young people and even nursery people, uh, nursery babies, uh, some of the toughest questions. Uh, but they want to know, and your babies think about their future. So this is a wonderful book that you may want to add to your library. Uh, here's another book entitled 101 Questions to Answers about the Book of Revelation by Dr. Mark Hitchcock. Uh, great book. Uh, he covers each chapter uh, with questions uh, related to uh, each chapter in the Book of Revelation. Now, we just completed a series. It's Pack 1, Pack 2. Uh, it's called Understanding the Book of Revelation, 71 TV Programs. Uh, it took us two years to complete this, but it's a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Revelation. So we have it here in 24 DVDs, or we have it in three USBs. It's uh, 71 TV programs, video and audio. But again, 30-minute programs, we took it from our TV program. Uh, the message I'm sharing in part one and part two of my session is 10 signs we are living in the end times. And I'll explain that as we go forward. We do have that also in a USB format. We have our Bible Prophecy Manual. It's entitled Bible Prophecy, God's Order of Events. Uh, we yeah, just sorry. updated the manual since the last time I was here. Uh, we also have our full uh, dispensational chart in the back. Uh, it's designed, again, to help you understand yeah. Bible prophecy. Then we have our website, which is www.according2prophecy.org. 
Uh, we're also part of the social media platforms. Uh, we've been online since 1995. We've had a web presence. Uh, we've been teaching now 41 years, and uh, it's to God's glory that we, uh, we've been doing this. Uh, we also have a weekly program that airs on his channel. How many here watch our program on his channel? They can't, okay, they can't hear you in the lobby. Okay. I can hear Pastor. <laughs> All right. Uh, our program is called Your Future in Bible Prophecy. Again, it's a weekly program that airs every week. And then last but not least, uh, this is our new app, and you can just uh, scan it with your camera, the QR code. You can download the app. Uh, we have a, a monthly uh, video of the month as well as our archive of videos there. Uh, a lot of material there that we're going to be adding uh, to the app, but all of these are designed to help you grow uh, in your prophetic understanding. Now, the message this morning, part one, 10 signs we are living in the end times. I want you to bow your hearts as we ask the Lord to bless his word. Father God, it's a privilege, first and foremost, as we stand before you, the giver of life, the creator of all life. Father, it's a privilege as we stand today before your people. Now, Lord, as we go into your word, I ask by your Holy Spirit that you would open the scriptures to our hearts. Let our hearts burn within us, O oh God, as you, uh, as you reveal the urgency of the hour. Uh, let us, dear God, become evangelists to reach a lost world uh, as we understand how close it really is. Now, Lord, we give you all the honor and all the glory, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ten signs we're living in the end times. Now, we know that there are more than ten signs, but I'm only going to focus on ten uh, in this particular uh, session, and then I'll explain uh, a little bit more. Now, I'm a topical teacher. I'll give you a number of topics. First, we'll look at warnings to be vigilant and observant. Now, normally what I do, I normally have this part in my message at the end, but I'm going to start it off this time. Uh, giving a warning to be vigilant and observant. Then we're going to actually look at the 10 signs or the 10 indicators that we've entered the end time season. Then we'll look at how should we live or how should we allow these signs uh, to affect us. I mean, how should we live in these times? And then last, we're going to look at the signs at a glance. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to give 25 signs at a glance. So that means I'm going to hit them fast. So you have to take notes or either uh, once I get them all up on the screen, Take a, take a screenshot of it and you have the signs. But these are signs at a glance, and it's really good to have them uh, to, to help you to uh, discern where, where we are. Now, I want to bring in our prophecy chart, and we are currently in what's called the church age. This is the dispensation where we are now, the church age. I believe the next major event on God's calendar is that event of the rapture of the church. Uh, we do know once the church is raptured, we also understand that there will be a tribulation. But all of the signs and all the indicators that I'm going to be dealing with all of them point to the second coming. Uh, this is the second coming at the uh, end, of the, uh, end of the tribulation, uh, right before the millennial kingdom. All of the signs point to the second coming. There are no signs for the rapture. I get a question all the time. Brother Perkins, uh, uh, can you give me signs for the rapture? I said, I can't. Uh, the signs, uh, I mean, the rapture is an imminent event. Uh, and again, there, there are no indicators. So if we're seeing signs that point to the second coming, it lets us know that the rapture is even closer. And uh, therefore, uh, we uh, should receive the urgency of the hour. Uh, you're looking at an evangelist teacher who loves the harvest. Uh, I go after the harvest because I, I, I believe the word. So we're going to start and we're going to look at some wonderful things. God has so beautifully placed in his word, uh, in, in his word, signs that point to the return of his son in the last days. These signs are the most powerful way in which God warns the world that Jesus is coming back. They are indicators and markers in time just where we are on God's prophetic calendar. If we don't recognize the times and see how close it really is, we will take for granted these warnings and admonitions. It, <clears throat> it will cause us to be unprepared for the task of reaching the harvest, resulting in becoming lazy and apathetic when it comes to the urgency of the end times. You know, I can tell when a Christian understands the end times or not by the way they live in the present. Uh, this is a motivator for me. Uh, it keeps the fire of God on my heart uh, to spend time in his word, uh, to reach the harvest and a lost world. So we're going to look at a warning now to be vigilant and observant. And I'm one of those preachers that like to define things. So what does the term vigilant mean? It means to be alertly watchful, especially to avoid danger. It means to uh, keeping careful watch for possible danger or difficulty. So you're a vigilant believer. 
Uh, you're not just a haphazard believer, just out there, just, you know, you, you're vigilant, you're looking, you're observant. Uh, observant means paying careful attention, watchful. A quick, a quick to observe, and you're keen, careful in observing, and you're mindful. Uh, I really believe that every believer in these latter days should be mindful, should be watchful believers. Uh, you know, people tell me, Brother Perkins, I don't like watching the news because it's all bad news. I say, well, it's how you look at the news. If you look at it with a prophetic eye, you have a whole different perspective. You know, I watch the same news that they watch, but I look at it with a prophetic eye. Uh, I understand. I say, Lord, you said that these are events uh, would happen in our times. And as we are seeing these events, uh, it really lets us know that the word of God is true. Now, in light of that, we're looking at warnings uh, and, and uh, warnings to be observant and vigilant. Uh, very familiar passage here, Hebrews 10, 25, the writer wrote, he says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. In order to see the day approaching, you must know what you're looking for. Now, I will say this, COVID has done a number on the church. Uh, as I travel from coast to coast, across the country, a lot of pastors tell me, Brother Perkins, you know, I'm, I'm just, it, we experience a hard time getting our church to come back, uh, getting our members to come back to church. Uh, I, I, I've been challenging Christians from coast to coast, it's time to get back to church. It's time to get back into fellowship. You know, it's, it's time to mingle with the sheep. You know, you need to smell like sheep again. You know what I mean? Uh, it's time to mingle. Uh, the scripture says here, exalting one another. Uh, we do this. We come together in fellowship. And as we do, especially because we see the day approaching, uh, this is the hour that we really should be coming together and allowing God, uh, you know, to use us uh, collectively. Uh, in Matthew 24, 33, Jesus said this, So likewise, when ye shall see these things, know that it is near even at the door. When you see these things, we're seeing indicators. Know that it's close. And again, it's going to help you. Look at this. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses uh, 1 through 6. Paul wrote this. He says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Yourselves perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Verse 5, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. See, we understand the indicators, so these times should not affect us. Again, I watch Christians. I look at Christians all the time. Many Christians, believe it or not, are really freaking out because of the times. Now, it tells me when, when I see that, it tells me that they don't understand the future. Uh, they don't understand what the Bible says about the times in which we are living. Uh, you know, nothing that is happening today has caught Father God off guard. You know, God under, knew that Putin would go into the Ukraine. That didn't, oh, what is he doing? No, that didn't catch God off guard. No, <laughs> God, God, he knows everything. And because we are his sons and daughters, he has so beautifully placed in the scriptures the end of the story. Uh, he's given us warnings in the word that we can see as indicators to know just where we are. So these, these days should not catch us off guard. Verse 6, Paul said, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. We need to be sober-minded believers in these latter times. Uh, in order to reach a lost world that don't, that don't know him. Now, look at this next one I'm going to give you. I love this passage, James 5, 9, and 10. James wrote, he says, Be ye also patient, establish or establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Uh, grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door. Do we really believe that we're living in the end times? Well, I believe, you, I believe you do. I mean, you're here on a, on a Saturday morning. You could be doing other things. So I do believe that you believe that. Now, I want to give a powerful quote here from a book. Well, before I give that quote, this is 1 Peter 4, 7. Peter wrote this, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Uh, we understand we're in the end time. So as a result, we should be sober. And we should be watchful believers unto prayer. 
Now, I'm going to quote from the book. It's called The Road to Armageddon. I'm going to quote here Chuck Swindoll. And uh, this is a, just an amazing quote, but it's dealing with the, uh, uh, the lethargic life of our times. Uh, listen to this. He said, in a declining culture, one of its characteristics ordinary people are unaware of what is happening. Only those, uh, those who know and can read the signs of decadence are posing the questions that, uh, that as yet uh, has no answers. Mr. Average Man is comfortable in his complacency and is unconcerned as a silverfish in a carton of discarded magazines on world affairs. He is not asking questions because his social benefits from the government gives him a false sense of security. And that's where a lot of people are. They just, you know, I'm retired now. I'm, I'm comfortable. I'm doing what I'm, I'm all right. Well, this is his trouble and his tragedy. Modern man has become a spectator of world events, observing on his television screen without becoming involved. He watches the ominous events of our times pass before his eyes, on his beer in his comfortable chair. He does not seem to realize that, listen at this, he does not seem to realize what is happening to him. He does not understand that his work and he is a with it. This is where the culture is. Uh, a lot of people are where we are. Uh, they want to be comfortable in, in where they are and what they're doing. And uh, as a result of that, this world is going, to, is going to catch them off guard. Uh, and again, God wants us to be vigilant. This is one reason why God gave us signs and indicators. Uh, he, he, he didn't have to do that, but he put it in Scripture so we can know. So let's look at the signs. Now, what I'm going to do here, we've got 10 signs, and then I know I'm going to do uh, part of it here and then the latter, in, the, in the latter part of it. Uh, is my mic going on and off? Uh, I'll take a hand mic if you've got one of those. I can, I can go. All right. I'll keep going until they get get a mic to me because it's going off on and off. Sign number one. We'll look at the first sign here, and this is a sign of apostasy in the church and true saints. This is um is is upon us right now, no doubt about it. Uh, let me define the term apostasy. From the Greek, it's the uh, term apostasia. It means it means uh, defection or departure, uh, a revolt or rebellion, a willful falling away from or rebellion against Christianity. Apostasy means to fall away from the truth. Therefore, an apostate is someone who once even then rejected the truth of God. Apostasy is a rebellion against God because it is rebellion against truth. We've truly entered this season, and I'll be honest with you, saying it's a very frightful time uh, that we're looking at today. And again, I I'm just amazed at how the Word of God is literally coming to pass. But I'm going to give you a few verses here in regards to this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses uh, 3, what he says, Let no man deceive you by any means. By any means. All right. He's going to bring the mic. Okay. Thank you, sir. One. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. First, Thessalonians, second Thessalonians chapter two, verse number three. Paul wrote this. He says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. This term falling away is the term apostasy. In other words, uh, there will be a, a, an apostasy that would take place uh, in the last days. And again, this is where we are. We are literally seeing this happen. In 1 uh, Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. That's apostasy. Depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Uh, I really believe that a lot of people are falling away because of what they are listening to and what they are reading. Uh, you got to be very, very careful in these latter days uh, what you are listening to. But people are departing. From the faith. Look at this. Uh, verse uh, 3, verse 4, Paul wrote this. He says, For the time will come when they would not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. We have a culture now, even in the church, who don't want to hear truth. 
Uh, don't give me something that's going to shake my world. Uh, give me something that's going to make me comfortable, uh, make me feel good about myself. Uh, I'm going to feel happy every time I come to church. You know, uh, I have a pastor in San Diego, and I tell my pastor all the time, I say, Pastor, preach the word. And there's times my pastor preaches a message, and I sit there in, in, on the pew there, and the word cut me to pieces. And I said, Pastor, thank you. Thank you for the word. It challenged me today, and by God's grace, I make adjustments in my life. You know, uh, we should not, not always want a comfortable word. You want a word that's going to help you live a godly life. And again, we have a culture today that does not want that. Now, as a result of that, uh, the apostasy has entered. So I'm going to show you some examples of apostasy, okay? And again, look at this. This is just amazing here. This poster says, this pastor is pro-choice. Meet the religious group fighting to save abortion access. Makes no sense. The Episcopal Church, United Methodist Church, Presbyterian Church, and Judaism are a few of many religious groups that support legal abortion. As uh, the future of Roe versus Wade hangs in the balance, many faith leaders, including, listen at this, uh, people affiliated with religious groups that have historically opposed abortion are taking a stance and fighting for abortion access. This is apostasy, saints. You got to hear me. I, I don't understand the, the, the connection here. Uh, you know, we do not agree with abortion. In a Pew survey, more than 50% of people from different religious groups support legal abortion. Listen to this. Religious groups from many denominations are working to preserve access to abortion care if Roe versus Wade is overturned. And we know that it was Overturned, thank God for that. Uh, but abortion still continues. Look at this. While some religious groups like Catholic Church or Southern Baptists oppose abortion in all cases, other groups like Epis uh, Episcopal Church and the United Methodist Church support abortion access. On the ground, members of the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice have partnered with legal, I mean, with local clergy to visit abortion clinics to offer spiritual guidance for staff who deal with harassment from anti-abortion protesters. That's an oxymoron. Yeah. Uh, I don't understand that a clergy <clears throat> going to help people that do abortion to deal with the, the people that's talking against abortion. Saints, we are truly looking at apostasy. Uh, it has definitely happened. Now, I'm going to show you a few things that's going to be very shocking, so hang on. Uh, this next one... Uh, once I heard this, I had to go online to verify it, and uh, this is going to shock you. Some of you may have heard about this. This is a pastor by the name of Jam Pastor Jamal Bryant. Uh, listen to this. A Georgia pastor wants uh, his church to grow cannabis uh, to, <laughs> to attract more congregants and teach young black men urban farming. I'm looking for people who smell like weed. When I first heard this, I said, unbelievable. I had to go see it. I went and checked it out. I watched the interview myself. Uh, listen at this. Georgia pastor says he wants to adopt growing cannabis to attract members, particularly young men. Pastor Jamal Bryant said he wants to teach young black men farming. Well, if you want to do that, teach them how to grow corn and, 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 and you know, uh, don't teach them how to grow weed. His comments uh, were met with criticism on social media, and, and I know that it was. Uh, the pastor is facing criticism after proposing a form, a form, proposing a form on church grounds that grows cannabis to boost memberships to promote entrepreneurship for, for young black men, according to KATU, uh, uh, which is the ABC affiliate. Now, this pastor, I mean, it just it blew my mind. Uh, that this pastor wants to do it. He claims to have the largest uh, land out of any pastor in America, and they want to use this to, you know, to grow cannabis. Now, uh, you know, these young men will not learn farming. Uh, they're going to learn how to be dope dealers. And again, whenever a pastor agrees with this, you're saying that it's okay to smoke marijuana. That's literally what you're saying. Uh, this is apostasy. Now, I'm going to go a step further and show you another one. And this, um, many of you know this, this lady I'm about to show you now. Uh, Amy Grant. Uh, I, love, I love Amy Grant. I loved her music when she first came out. Uh, listen to this. Amy Grant, to host uh, niece's same-sex wedding, believes Jesus wants us to love God and love each other. Where God wants us to love God and love each other. 
uh, but he don't want us to love sin, and he does not want us to condone sin. But look at this. Award-winning singer Amy Grant has revealed she is planning to host a marriage of her niece and her uh, niece and her same-sex partner. Uh, this really broke my heart. Speaking uh, to the Washington Post, she spoke of the positive impact on her family of having a close relative who is gay. Honestly, from a faith perspective, she said, I do always say, Jesus, you just narrowed it down to two things, love God and love each other. Uh, she said, I mean, hey, that's pretty simple. Well, you know, I think we have what's called a false balance in the church today. Proverbs 11.1 1 says this. It says, a false balance is an abomination to God, but a just weight is his delight. God is a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. And you got to see the both sides of God. You know, God created heaven, but God also created hell. Uh, he's a just God. And uh, I think what's happened, I, I normally use the term sloppy agape. Uh, this is a... This is a false view of love. And again, you know, uh, a lot of Christians have literally bought into this. Now, I got one more I want to show you here. And many of you know this gentleman, which this also broke my heart. But I'm showing you the end times. We are seeing things that have crept into our culture. Uh, and some of you may have seen. I'm not going to quote a lot about this, but Pastor Anley Stanley uh, of late. And this just broke my heart, uh, saints. Uh, mega, uh, mega church pastor Andy Stanley is being criticized for a recent sermon illustrating involving a gay couple which uh, Stanley labeled adultery but not the homosexuality of sin. And again, this just broke my heart. Uh, he went through this whole diatribe here and he talked about uh, uh, two men, two, uh, two gay men in his church. Uh, the one guy was married. He, he, he left his wife for another gentleman. Uh, and then uh, he had to leave the church, but he went to one of his other churches. And then uh, they allowed both of those gay men to, to be enlisted in service in church, uh, never dealing with the adultery part of it uh, until he found out that the other gay man was not uh, uh, separated from his wife yet or divorced from his wife. When he found that out, he pulled both of them out of service, uh, not because they were homosexual, but because they were still living in adultery. Uh, again... This broke my heart, saints, broke my heart. And again, you know, I'm not going to quote all of this because this is just amazing uh, uh, what he said. But you can actually go online and literally, literally see the whole, the whole thing. But it, it, it was just tragic uh, uh, to know that this, this was going on. You know, the Bible is quite clear uh, when it comes to the sin of homosexuality. Now, Jesus died not only for homosexuals. He died for adulterers. He died for fornicators. Uh, he died for uh, sin, period. Uh, sin is sin. Jesus died for all sin. Jesus loved all sinners. We love all sinners. But in 2 Peter uh, th uh, 2, 6, Peter wrote this, talking about God giving an example and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, uh, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that, who should live uh, ungodly. Uh, God deals really strong uh, with that sin. Uh, Jesus died to save them. I mean, people need to come out of sin. Uh, you don't condone it. You don't live in it. You come out of it. And again, uh, God, you know, God, he deals with it that way. So for time, I'm going to move on to sign number two. Here's the next sign we'll look at. Uh, this sign is the sign of wars and rumors of wars. Now, again, we know that these are events that are happening before us today. Uh, how many have ever heard of the uh, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists? Uh, this is a group of Nobel laureates. Uh, these men, uh, they've been here since the 40s, this group has. And what they do, they produce a clock called the Doomsday Clock. And what they do based on their discernment of world events, they move the clock toward midnight or they take it away from midnight. Well, the King is Coming TV reported this. The world is closer to annihilation than it has ever been since the first nuclear bomb were released at the close of World War II. The bulletin of the atomic scientists said, uh, this was January 24, 2023, the time on the doomsday clock moved forward from 100 seconds uh, to midnight to 90 seconds to midnight. So in other words, this group of Nobel laureates, now they're not Christian. These are Nobel laureates, very smart, brilliant guys, but they don't understand prophecy. But they discern the times like we should be doing. They're looking at world events and they looked at this and they said, you know, 
because of what is going on now, they believe that we are 90 seconds away from the end of the world. Now, they don't understand. We understand the end of the story. I mean, we know that God has already planned out the future. He's already given it to us. Uh, truly, we should see events that the Bible talk about. Well, we have wars and we have rumors of wars that are before us today as a sign and an indicator. Uh, Matthew 24, 6, Jesus said this, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Jesus said this, see that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. We find this in Mark 13 as well, 13, 7, and Luke 21, 9. So Jesus said, right before I come, you're going to see uh, wars and you're going to see rumors of wars. This is an indicator of where we are. You know, people are freaking out today about Putin. Uh, is Putin going to push that nuclear button that's going to set off every nuclear bomb in the world? You know what I'm saying? I don't worry about it at all. You know why? Because the sovereign God is in control. Not only that, because God has so beautifully given us the end of the story. We know exactly how things will play out based on his prophetic word. So I sleep good every night. Uh, I watch the same news that you watch, but I sleep good every night. But in light of that, there is the wars and there's the rumors of wars. This is a, a, a chart here. Where are the world's ongoing conflicts? And here, this chart actually shows uh, territorial wars, civil wars, interstate wars, political uh, instability, sectarianism, all different types of things uh, that are going on around the world that we don't even realize. Wars are continuing uh, as the scripture predict in our times. Wars and rumors of wars. Uh, we even have territorial wars in the streets, gang violence. All those are different types of wars that are literally going on. But in light of Putin, I want to I give you this. Putin threatens nuclear war. The West must deter disaster. Twice recently, Russian President Vladimir, Vladimir Putin has raised the, pers the prospect of using nuclear weapons in war. To, uh, in war, he launched uh, to destroy the Ukraine with Russia forcing retreating in the Ukraine, uh, Dan, Danbos region. Mr. Putin threatened among, uh, uh, amounts to uh, desperate saber rattling intended to frighten all, but his threats must not be brushed off completely given Mr. Putin's record of folly and recklessness. Now, again, I look at this as a rumor of war. Uh, Jesus said wars and rumors of war. You know, there are no winners when the nukes go off, I'll be honest with you. Uh, there's, there's no winners there. Uh, again, wars and rumors of wars. Uh, again, this, this is the time in which we're living in. We're seeing all different types of things uh, uh, that are going on. So in light of that, I want to quote here from the book Any Day Now. This is uh, Amir Safadi, and I like what he said. He said this, if we take time to look around us, we, we can't help but realize that there is a strong sense of any day now in the world. It is so obvious to me, and I'm not the only one who feels it. Uh, in, uh, in early 2017, the number one Google search, uh, for, uh, search for was World War III. It hit its highest level ever. What, uh, what precipitated this strike, uh, the, the combination of President Donald Trump's uh, escalation of activities in Syria and his dealing with North Korea. Uh, both of these situations have come since that moment of national panic, but there is still a sense of something significant is going on. Within us is a built-in curiosity about what is going to happen in the future, a sense that, uh, a, uh, and a sense that the way the world is now must eventually come to an end. And I think all of us can feel that we're in the end times. How many would agree with that? Uh, I mean, there's so much that's going on today. Uh, listen, science, it is evident that time is winding up. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I made a statement many times when I teach on the rapture. Some of you may have heard me say this. Uh, I believe in the rapture so much, I believe that it is at hand that I take rapture drills, you know. I'm ready. <laughs> I really believe, I really believe that we are seeing some amazing events uh, that are pointing to the second coming that's letting us know the rapture is even closer. And again, we're seeing those things now. Let's look at sign number three. Sign number three is Latter-day Scoffers. Latter-day Scoffers. So what is a scoffer? And I like this picture here. Here you have a guy preaching and then a guy mocking him. He's mocking him. Uh, this is truly scoffers. So, scoffers. so let me define the term. What is a scoffer? 
It's a person who mocks or make fun of someone or something, often religions, I mean religion, or of moral value. A scoffer, uh, an expression of scorn or derision or contempt, uh, the object of scorn, mockery, or derision, to show contempt by, der by derisive acts or language. These are people that mock they make fun of Christian. They make fun of the gospel. They make fun of the word. Uh, they, they, they do all these crazy things uh, in regards to that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you in a few minutes uh, some mockery, okay, uh, of how the world mocks, uh, mocks the truth uh, of the word, or they make fun of it, uh, or they poke at it. Okay, I'm going to show you that. But in light of that, let me give you some passages here. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, Peter wrote this. He said, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continued as they were from the beginning of creation. When you go and read the text there, uh, uh, Pete even said that these people are willingly ignorant. They're ignorant willingly. Uh, they don't want to know the signs. But they mock. They say, where is the promise of his coming? You guys have been talking about Jesus coming for 20, 30 years, and he have not come back yet. They mock us. They make fun of us. Well, it's going to happen. We know that. It's going to happen. Look at this next one. Jude chapter 1, verse 17 through 19. Jude wrote this. He said, but beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, not having the spirit. So here, uh, Jew said in the latter days, you're going to have these, these mockers out there. They're going to they're gonna mock you. They're going to mock what you believe. Uh, they're going to scorn uh, the gospel. They're going to scorn the word. So in light of that, I'm going to show you an unusual picture here. And then I'm going to explain to you how I believe that this is a latter-day mocking uh, of the word, and they're poking at the word. So now this picture you see here may look a little confusing, but just hang on. I'm going to explain it to you. Look at this. Bell worship resurrected. Massive ce uh, celebration of globalism shows Satanists are no longer hiding in the shadows. And I'm going to quote here from Jan Markell. Jan Markell said this. I often write articles titled, I never thought I would see the day. Well, the resurrection of ancient uh, Baal, along with literal Baal worship, was, uh, was a scene you had to see to believe. Now, what you're going to see here, this image is a, is a red-colored bull that came into an arena. I'm going to explain it to you, and I'm going to show you a different view of it. She said this, blatant Baal worship. They aren't even trying to hide it anymore. During the open ceremonies of the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham, England, on July 28th of last year, a giant mechanical bull with glowing red eyes was rolled, uh, rolled out into the center of the Alexandria Stadium. Uh, a total of 72 nations participated in the Commonwealth Games. And so this opening ceremony was being viewed on countless television screens all over the planet. Now, what was amazing about it, this was a big old red bull, okay? So this big old red bull was brought into the arena, and then a lady actually wrote the bull. I mean, we're going to see that in a few minutes. Now, I'm showing you the mockery of the European Union. This is what they do all the time. They mock the word. Uh, we find in the book of Revelation, chapter 17, uh, 3, it talks about the woman on the bull, uh, on the beast. Look at this. So he, cried, so he, carried, so he carried me away in the spirit. Uh, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sat on a, a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, what's ironic here is that uh, when this mechanical bull came into the arena, uh, these people began to worship this thing, and the woman was riding a red beast. Uh, the European Union, their headquarters, one of their emblems is a woman riding the beast. Uh, outside of the arena, I mean, the no, the facility itself of the European Union, they made it to look just like uh, the Tower of Babel. Uh, these people, they mock or they make fun or they poke uh, at the word of God. Look at this picture here. Uh, this woman, she's riding this red bull, red beast. Uh, and again, they're just mocking 
uh, what the Bible says. Now, look at this next picture. This is just amazing here. Uh, you have people all around this big red bull with the woman on it, uh, and they're literally worshiping. You ought to go online and just read and listen to what they talked about. Uh, they worship. Now, in the, in the background there, look in the background. This is the Tower of Babel in the background. The world mocking the Bible. They're making fun of it. They're mocking the word. Uh, look at here. Here's the woman on the bull. Uh, on the beast, and again, these people worshiping uh, uh, the new king, King Charles, he presided over this commonwealth game. Uh, it's amazing, saints. I mean, the things that are happening uh, in our times as a form of mockery. And I'm going to show you one more mockery. Uh, there was a movie that came out, I think in 2013, it was called Rapture Palooza. Uh, now, I, I teach on the rapture. Tom had just taught on the rapture. Uh, the world hates the rapture. So look at this. This movie came out. It's called Rapture Palooza. This was truly a mockery of the word of God. Uh, this movie here, uh, this guy represents uh, the Antichrist, and he's trying to get with this young lady to marry him. But the whole uh, theme of this movie, they were mocking the rapture of the church. In the movie, they had, a, they had a network. It's called the Rapture Network. And in this, they showed people as they were being raptured from uh, uh, off the toilet. Uh, they was raptured here. I mean, they made so much fun of the rapture. They mocked the rapture. But they also had something. Now, I didn't see the movie. I saw the trailer, and the trailer was enough for me. Look at this. This 2013 movie depict Jesus being accidentally shot out of the sky at his second coming by a laser beam. He, uh, then he and his horse is shown lying on the ground smoldering. I said, devil, you are a liar. How many know that you cannot shoot Jesus out of the sky when he come back? The Bible says when Christ comes back in second coming, Revelation 19, the Bible says he's coming back with fire in his eyes. He's coming back as a man of war. The Bible says when the world see him, they're going to wail at him. They're going to mourn at the return of Christ. When Christ coming back, he's coming back as a conquering king. Uh, you won't be able to shoot him out of the sky with no laser. But the world, they mock and they scoff at biblical things. And again, we need to, we need to see that and understand it. Now, let's move a little further. Uh, we're going to look at sign number four. Sign number four, end time technology. And again, I really like this. And we do know based on technology, I mean, technology is literally a part of our uh, end times. And again, I'm going to quote a verse here. We know this passage uh, that's tied to the mark of the beast. Uh, we have a full teaching on our table on the mark of the beast. But Revelation 13, 16, John wrote, and he calls all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Now, we know... When John received this prophecy in regards to the mark of the beast, he talked about men during the time of tribulation would not be able to buy or sell unless they have this unique mark. Uh, at the time when John received this prophecy, there was no way in John's day that this prophecy could come to pass. But we're living in a time now where this prophecy can come to pass. And again, I'm going to show you a few examples of how I believe technology uh, will be uh, used to aid Antichrist. Now, I want to also say this as a Christian. Uh, we don't need to be afraid of technology. Uh, I have a lot of Christians that will not go on the line, or go on the internet because they think it's the mark of the beast. Or uh, they go to the grocery store and they change, come back six dollars and sixty-six cent. What do they do? They buy some Rolaids or some juicy fruit. <laughs> they do something to get off of that six-six-six number. Uh, I call it Christian six-six-six paranoia. Uh, as a believer, you do not have to fear the mark of the beast. You won't be here uh, when the mark of the beast is implemented. Uh, we, we will actually be raptured before that would even come on the scene. But technology, I do believe, will aid Antichrist during that time. So in light of that, I want to quote here uh, from the World Economic Forum. Listen at this. The latest high controversial uh, uh, technology policy that the World Economic Forum, or the EWEF, uh, has set out to no normalize is the idea, listen at this, of implanting tracking, uh, tracking chips into humans. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that those speculating on the future where this, happen this is happening would be dismissed as a conspiracy theorist. But now the world elite's most vocal outlets uh, is predicting that chips implanted will eventually become just a commodity. Uh, they believe in that people have chips in their bodies is going to be just a normal thing. And this is what they, what they want to do. Uh, they want to they implant chips in everybody. Uh, nobody's putting any chips in Brother Perkins. Uh, I won't be chipped. Absolutely not. 
But in light of that, things are happening, I do believe, uh, that is aiding, uh, aiding this. So I'm going to give you another thing. Uh, Amazon. How many have heard of Amazon One? Uh, Amazon One, listen at this. Amazon One is part of the company's mission to use contactless technology that makes it faster to pay. The tech works like this. You, uh, users visit the kiosk or the point of sale station at participating locations to link their palm or, or a palm and pay, a payment card to the service. Then all they have to do during the checkout process is hover their hand over the scanner to complete the transaction. Now, uh, I'm going to show you a very eerie video in a few minutes here. Now, I want to say this too, though. The video I'm going to show you now, uh, this is an eerie video. This, this is Zoe. Uh, this, was, uh, this was produced. This is a commercial that is put out by Amazon, talking about Amazon One. And I want to show you this. And uh, just it's, it's self-explanatory. Listen at this. This is Zoe. Just like you, she uses lots of different cards and IDs to get through her day. What if all Zoe needed was herself? Introducing Amazon One, a free service that lets you use your palm to quickly pay for things, gain access, earn rewards, and more. Let's say you're grabbing your favorite coffee beverage, or heading into the office, or checking out. Just hover your palm and you're on your way. It's as easy as that. Sign up is free and takes less than a minute. All you need is a credit card, your phone number, and your palm. That's it. Since your palm is unique and can't be lost or misplaced, you can get things done quickly and securely. And with more experiences on the way, Amazon One will help you get even more done, simply by being you. Now, Zoe has more time to do what she loves, indoor skydiving. Enter, identify, and pay with Amazon One. Enter, identify, and pay with Amazon One. Now, I'm not, this is not the mark of the beast. Brother Perkins did not say Amazon created the mark of the beast. But I will tell you this, technology, I believe, is being worked out for the time when that season comes upon us. Uh, they track everything you do. Uh, uh, we're going to a whole, uh, a whole digital culture. Uh, you know, uh, I really don't like carrying cash, I'll be honest with you. I use digital currency all the time. Uh, but we're in a digital world uh, that I believe that's going to really aid the Antichrist doing, you this? Know, you know, doing that time. Uh, how many know Elon Musk? I've heard of Elon Musk. Uh, Elon Musk, the, the guy is a genius, no doubt about it. Uh, but I do believe that God has allowed him to have technology that will aid during the time of the tribulation. I really believe that. Uh, this guy, he wants to uh, load the world with satellites. And I'm going to read this. Look at this. Elon Musk's vision is to launch 42,000 satellites into orbit in order to cover the entire world with high-speed internet worldwide. To date, he has launched 2,500 satellites, and now it's more than that, uh, with SpaceX company. Now, what his plans are to do is to launch these low-orbit satellites all over the world to bring internet and connectivity to the world. Uh, in the most remotest places, they're going to connect the world. Now, what's so significant about that as an end-time event, uh, I believe that God is allowing technology to be placed into uh, orbit and, and in place for the time of the end times. Uh, I believe that we are seeing signs and indicators that events that will take place in tribulation are casting a shadow in our times. And I believe that, that even this can be used uh, to allow the whole world to be connected. You know, uh, there's a term they use now, it's called a digital dossier. Uh, every one of us have a digital dossier. Everywhere you go, uh, elevators, everything you do is tracked. You know, people talk about, I'm going off the grid. Well, guess what? They watch you go off the grid. <laughs> they see you go off the grid. Uh, they know where you are, you know. Uh, your, your body gives off heat. They know where you are. Listen, we're in a culture now that can literally aid the Antichrist, and do what he's going to do. And this is why I believe that this is end time. Uh, it's a sign of the end times. Uh, technology, again, in John's day, there was no way possible that, that you could track men's buying and selling, but now you can. And with these low satellites being able to, to connect the entire world, they can track everything all over the world. And again, it is truly 
uh, a sign and an indicator. But again, I shared with you earlier, saints, I do not worry about where we are. Uh, I sleep good every night because I know God is in control. Uh, a sovereign God has everything under control, but he revealed these things so we can be prepared and we can allow this to motivate us to reach a lost world. We have family members not saved. We have coworkers that are not saved. We have people that God bring across your path. My wife and I, we fly so much. I have an airplane ministry. Yeah, I have a jet ministry. And what I mean by that, I'm on an airplane. I don't know who's going to sit next to me. And I'm a minister. I say, Lord, uh, who, who will you have today? I have so many uh, uh, preaching sermons online, I mean, uh, in the air. It's amazing to me. People say, uh, sir, what do you do? I said, okay. You, <laughs> you started it. I let them know. I said, I'm a preacher of the gospel. They said, really? And then I tell them what I do, and they go, really? And then we have church on the plane. It is amazing. But you're looking at a preacher because I understand where we are, saints, that it has motivated, it stirred my heart uh, to go after the harvest. And God want to use every one of us in these latter days. Uh, he want to use you in some capacity uh, to reach, uh, reach, reach a, lost, a lost, lost person. Uh, you have family members. You have loved ones. And I'm going to say this too, and then I'm going to give, the, give you the last sign, but we won't go to it. We're going to pick it up part two. But I want to say, say this to you. Don't be afraid to offend your loved ones if telling them the gospel offends them. Offend them so they can spend eternity with you. You know, the Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kiss of an enemy is deceitful. If I'm your friend, tell me the bridge is out. Don't let me go off the, off the, off the cliff when you knew the bridge was out. Don't let me go to hell when you know truth. You know, sometimes we don't want to offend people by giving them truth, but you know something? Sometimes offending them in love will cause them to spend eternity with you. You got to have a different perspective. You know, I, I go after my love. I go after them with a love passion, but I go after them because I want to see them in eternity with me. Now, we're going to look at sign number five in part two, and we're going to start off looking at the sign of preaching of the gospel. I want you to bow your hearts as I close this session. Father, we love you, and again, we thank you so much, Lord. There's so much in the scriptures, and Lord, uh, we don't have time to cover everything, but Lord, we are truly living in the times that you predicted in your word. Lord, make every one of us, oh God, make us evangelists. Lord, have us to go after the harvest. Let us see humanity the way you see them. And Lord, I pray, use us all in these latter days. We thank you, and we love you now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Isn't God good? Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I have two microphones. We're going to take a quick stretch break, and then Bill Federer is going to be with us. So uh, stretch, do what you have to for the next couple of minutes, and then Bill will be with us. I'm going to take this down.
Good. Well, Andy Woods, uh, pastor of Sugarland Bible Church, and he's president of Schaefer Theological Seminary. And he sends us a, a, a great greeting here. He said, uh, 2 Peter 1.19 describes Bible prophecy as a light shining at a dark place that we would be well to pay attention to. With our nation descending into spiritual and moral darkness, Bible prophecy represents the greatest of all subjects that the Christian can give themselves to today. This is why I prayerfully wish the best for Calvary Chapel of Lafayette as they're hosting the Midwest Bible Prophecy Conference. Not only are some of my all-time favorite Bible prophecy teachers, Don Stewart, Don Perkins, and Tommy Ice presenting, but also my favorite historian, Bill Fetter. <laughs> and so William Fetter, uh, how many of you, have you heard him on American Minute? You've heard him before? Yes, great. Has that, am I on? But he is a nationally known speaker, best-selling author, and president of AmeriSearch, a publishing company that dedicated to researching America's noble heritage. Bill is an expert on American history and its founding and founders. So we're really blessed to have him. He, he's, he's author of a multitude of books. You can see him out there in the, in the gathering area. He's also uh, been a candidate for Congress. Bill has appeared on C-SPAN, Fox, Hannity, CBN, the Eric Metaxas Show, Prager University, and Todd Starnes program. So we're blessed to have uh, Bill Federer with us today. Bill. Thank you, Pastor Joe. The, um, it's an honor for me to, to be with you, and uh, I'm just going to jump into my presentation. I do have a daily email I send out called American Minute. You can sign up for it at AmericanMinute.com. And uh, I teach history, and you think, well, history is not prophetic, but it is predictive. Past behavior is the best indicator of future performance, and so with knowing history and prophetic, you get a pretty good idea where things are headed. So one of the things I did is I decided I would research every single century of recorded human history to find out what the most common form of government is, and it's kings. And um, it took centuries before America was given a chance to break away from a king. And uh, so writing was invented around 3300 BC. Uh, take a stick, poke it in clay, right? Sumerian cuneiform. And uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics were invented around 3000 BC, and Chinese characters around 2600 BC. And uh, same with the Indus Valley. Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysicist in his Cosmos TV series, stood in the desert, and he said, it was here around 5,000 years ago between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that we learned how to write. Right? 5,000, so that we're 2080 or so. This is about 3,000 or so BC. And um, Franklin Roosevelt said, 5,000 years of recorded history have proven that mankind has always believed in God in spite of the many abortive attempts to exile God. Richard Overy wrote the Times Complete History of the World. He said, no date appears before the start of human civilizations around 5,500 years ago and the beginning of a written or pictorial history. And so let's just round it out to 6,000 because some of the founders use that number in their quotes. But 6,000 years of history, it's not that long. 6,000 years is just 60 people living 100 years each back to back. How many, of you, how many of you have met someone who's lived 100 years? Maybe a grandmother? We're talking 60 grandmothers, and you're all the way back to the beginning of recorded human history. 60 people living 100 years each, back to back, is 6,000 years. And now that we have 6,000 years of records, let's look at them. What do they show? They show it's been a 6,000-year quest to rule the world. And the first one was Nimrod Tower of Babel. And um, Josephus, the Jewish commentator, said Nimrod wanted to build the tower so high that if God destroyed the world again with a flood, he could survive on top. So it had this defiant, in-your-face attitude toward God. And Nimrod made everyone in town bake bricks and bring them, or he would kill them. And so it was oppressive over man. God comes down, confuses the languages, and the people scatter. But it's almost like every generation since has tried to rebuild the Tower of Babel. And each time it comes around, it's a little bit worse. 
because with military advancements, kings can kill more people, and with technological advancements, kings can track more people. And um, you ever saw the movie The Terminator with Arnold Schwarzenegger? And there's this metal robot that's chasing him, and they smash it, and uh, everybody in the audience sighs relief. But then this little pieces of metal melt into little silvery droplets, and then they sort of roll back together into this silvery pool, and then the hand of this Terminator starts coming out, and it somehow reassembles itself and starts chasing him, and everybody in the audience is like, how do you get rid of this thing? It's like, how do you get rid of this desire for man to want to have mankind to want to have the Tower of Babel rebuilt? And, um, you know, in geometry, there's something called the golden ratio, or phi, P-H-I, or the Fibonacci sequence, but it's a rate of geometric expansion that you observe in a seashell, in a tornado, in a hurricane, even in a galaxy. And it gets applied to other areas of academia, like investments. Right When Bitcoin first started taking off, they said, oh, it's going to grow at this rate, and this rate is going to grow. And I thought, has anybody applied it to history, to these kingdoms in history? And I hadn't, so I started to piece it together. And you got Nimrod, Tower of Babel. And then 2500 BC, you have Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, or Iraq. And he, the oldest story ever written in any language is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And he is the first one to put a wall around a city. And he goes on this long journey to meet this old guy who survived a global flood. Calls it a global flood. And um, the, uh, this old guy had built a boat, covered it with tar and pitch, filled it full of animals. The world was flooded and afterwards uh, repopulated the world. It's the story of Noah, written a thousand years before Moses. Matter of fact, over a hundred ancient civilizations have flood stories in their ancient past. And um, then in 25, 2250 BC, you have Sargon of Acadia, and he conquers a bunch of walled cities from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean. And then there's 2,000 years of Egyptian pharaohs and 5,000 years of Chinese emperors. And then around 700 BC, Assyria is the biggest empire the planet had seen up to this point. And Assyria takes the 10 northern tribes of Israel captive. But Assyria is conquered by Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, which is conquered by Cyrus of Persia. And this the is the balcony. largest empire that planet Earth had seen up to this point. And around the 5th, 6th century BC. But Persia is conquered by Alexander the Great. And 334 BC, he's got the biggest empire. And he stopped from going into India. And then India has Chandra Gupta and the Mara Empire. And it's the biggest empire, quarter of the world's population. And then around 25 BC, Augustus Caesar has the biggest empire, followed by Tiberius Caesar. And what do they do? They decide to do a census. It's a tra they want to track everybody. They want a worldwide tracking system. And uh, if they could add 5G and cell phones and uh, the satellites, they would have done that. And then you have an Askemite empire in Africa. And then Attila the Hun, 450 AD. He's got the biggest empire. All of Central Asia and conquering Europe. And then you have the Byzantine Empire. And then in the seventh century, Islam. And they conquer from the Persian Gulf to the Atlantic Ocean. They conquer Spain. And then the Muslims are stopped from going into Europe. And you got, uh, by Charles Martel, his grandson is Charlemagne. He's got the biggest empire. He's crowned Holy Roman Emperor in 800 AD. And then you got the Vikings, the year 1000, and they got boats with low keels. They go up every river in Europe and Russia. And they've got the biggest empire. And then you got 1200s, Genghis Khan conquers from Korea to Hungary. And they have the, the composite bow, right? New military advancement where you can shoot the bow and arrow uh, like 100 yards while you're riding a horse. And, um, and so uh, he kills 30 million people and has the biggest empire. And then his grandson's Kublai Khan that runs China. And then the 1400s, you got Tamerlane, kills 17 million, Central Asia. And then Ivan the Terrible in Russia, he's got the biggest empire, 12 time zones. Russia's huge. And then you cross the hemisphere to the west, and you have Montezuma. And he's in charge of the Aztec Mexican Empire. And Atahualpa is in charge of Inca Peru. And it's centralized, and they're kings. And, and then you have the king of Spain, 1500s, largest empire that planet Earth had seen up to this point. The Philippines are named after his son, King Philip of Spain. And then there's the 1600s, the king of France. Louis XIV, the Sun King, he's got the biggest empire. And he actually used to own the land that we're on. 
And, um, and then in the 1700s, 1800s, the king of Britain has the largest empire that planet Earth had ever seen. The king of England was a globalist. He was a one-world government guy with him at the top. Matter of fact, if any of these dictators had not have died, any one of them would have been happy to keep killing and conquering. So in that sense, death is a blessing, <laughs> and the devil has to start from scratch again. But anybody that can see that there's, you can plot, you can plot on a graph, at some point it's going to max out on a global level. And Jesus says, wheat and tares grow together till the harvest. Right? And, um, and, it, and I think, well, why are there the crisis? You know, before the flood, they were living centuries. They were living nearly a thousand years. And they, right before the flood, it says, the thoughts of man were on evil continually. And they chose not to retain God in their thoughts. And it repented God to, that he even made man. It, and then one translation says, it broke his heart. So why did I even make him? Could you imagine the Holy Spirit hovering in, some, in front of somebody's face for a thousand years, trying to get their attention, and they so structured their lives, they can live every day and not even think about him? And so, it's, in a sense, God has plan A and plan B, Right? He makes us as free will beings, gives us, wants us to turn to him. And, um, and so uh, plan A is he blesses us. He had to bless them with, with health and food. They were living these centuries. He blesses. Uh, so God blesses you and hopes that you turn to him out of gratefulness. If that doesn't work, mm, there is plan B. <laughs> he withholds the blessings. It says in Deuteronomy 28, he hides his face and lets you experience the consequences of your selfish decisions, and it gets bad, and then you turn to him out of desperation. Right? His goal is to have you turn to him, and there's an easy way and there's a hard way. <laughs> and through these centuries, when there's desperation, is when people end up turning to the Lord. So it's in times of crises that people turn to Christ. And um, anyway, so why does it keep repeating itself that power wants to concentrate? Because it's in each of our own fallen, selfish human DNA. And you got... Uh, Cain killing Abel and one king taking a kingdom from another king. St. Augustine called it libido dominandi, the lust to dominate. And so you put some babies in a playpen, one takes the rattle from the others. You put some kids on a playground, one's the bully hogging the ball. You put some junior high girls in a clique and one of them is the diva. <laughs> you put some natives in the woods, one of them is an Indian chief, and you put them in an inner city, one of them is a gang leader. And all a king is, is a glorified gang leader. It's a hierarchical system. If you are friends with the king, you are more equal. If you are not friends with the king, you are less equal. And if you're an enemy of the king, you're dead. It's called treason. Or you're a slave. People say, I thought slavery started in 1619. No, wherever you had the first king on top, you had slaves on the bottom. Right? It's a hierarchical system that keeps repeating itself wherever you have humans. <laughs> and it keeps happening around the world. And at some point, it's going to max out on a global level. And you think of it, what if you were the king? That'd be pretty neat. And then you have a sister, she, she gets married, she has a kid, now the kid's a teenager. He's drinking and partying and hits someone with the car and kills him. And now he's facing manslaughter charges and prison time, and your sister comes begging to you. She says, you're not going to let my little Johnny get locked away, are you? It wasn't his fault. Those other kids talked him into it, blah, blah, blah. What are you going to say to your own sister? Well, I'll uh, let little Johnny off the hook this time, but don't let it happen again. Guess what? As soon as you say that, you are the corrupt dictator. You just sent ripples through your kingdom that if somebody's family or friends with the king, they get special treatment. If they're not family and friends, they don't get that. And if someone wants to point out your favoritism, you're going to be embarrassed and be tempted to shut them up and get oppressive. So it just happens. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so um, you see that power wants to concentrate. It's like the pull of a magnet, like the law of gravity. Uh, even the movie Lord of the Rings, uh, there's a line where Gandalf tells Frodo, always remember Frodo, the ring is trying to get back to its master. It wants to be found. Power wants to concentrate. And uh, the movie goes on where little Frodo offers the ring to Gandalf. And Gandalf says, don't tempt me, Frodo. I dare not take it, not even to keep it safe. Understand, Frodo, I would use this ring from a desire to do good, but through me it would wield the power too great and terrible to imagine. What's he talking about? Every now and then you get a good king, and he wants to concentrate power so he can do good more efficiently. 
But he doesn't live forever. And at some point, that concentrated power gets passed on to some son or grandson that's a lousy ruler, but he likes his job, and he gets oppressive. And it's almost like the devil takes a little break and lets you do your own stuff, but as soon as you're gone, he's back in with a vengeance. What's the Bible example? Joseph in Egypt concentrates power into the hands of the Pharaoh. And what did that particular Pharaoh do with the power? He fed the children of Israel, gave them the best land of Goshen, gave him jobs taking care of his cattle. He was good. But then there was a new Pharaoh that did not know Joseph, and he used all that concentrated power to oppress the children of Israel, make them slaves, and even throw their sons in the Nile River. Right? And so we see this pull toward globalism. And what's the opposite of globalism? Localism. <laughs> in other words, we see this happening. Uh, you know, I ran for Congress three times and raised lots of money and, and um, uh, didn't win, came close. But the idea is you chill it, tell it to most people. And you're like, forget that. I can't. I can't raise money. But if you say, look, you drive by that school every day, and you know they're teaching transgenderism, and you know Jesus said in the beginning God made a male and female, and, um, and if you're silent, you're giving consent to that sin. And, and Jesus says that if you allow one of these little ones that believes me to stubble better than a millstone we put around your neck, and there's more people in church than vote in a school board election. <laughs> if local, j- just be concerned about what kids are talking about in your local area. And so the, so it's the opposite of globalism is get involved locally, locally, and... and um, Anyway, so the devil takes Jesus to a high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. You think that's pretty audacious of the devil to say that all the kingdoms of the world were delivered to him? When did he get them? when Adam sinned. Adam was in charge of the garden. We know that because he named everything. If you name something, you have authority over something. You have kids, you get to name your kids. So Adam was in charge, but the Bible says, to whomever you yield your members' servants to obey, to him you are a servant. The moment Adam obeyed Satan, he was posturing himself as the one taking the orders, and the devil usurped power as the one giving the orders. (laughs) And what is One of the similarities of all the kingdoms of the world, they're all ruled through fear. That's, Montesquieu said, that's the motivating spring. That's the the electricity that goes through these kingdoms. It's fear. And um, Jesus said, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, but ye shall not be so. He that is greatest among you, let him be as he that doth serve. I am among you as he that serveth. So we're talking kingdoms, and Jesus is talking about his kingdom, and his kingdom is bottom-up, and the motivating electricity is love. (laughs) So you got fear top-down, but you got love. So we're talking two different kinds of kingdoms. And uh, in a kingdom, who is the hardest person to meet? Well, the king. He's got a whole army and soldiers surrounding him. Well, if God's is the opposite in God's kingdom, who's the easiest person to meet? God himself. (laughs) He's as close as your heart and your mouth and the word, right? And um, so the the world's is top-down fear, and God's kingdom is bottom-up love, but we're talking kingdoms. You know, in reading through all these ancient, ancient kingdoms, I saw three things repeating themselves. One is the people groups would move from hunter-gathering to agriculture. We even have the Bible talking about Adam and Eve gathering, right, plucking food off the tree, and then Cain being a tiller of the soil. So we go from gathering to agriculture. And, uh, but it, this is something you observe when you read anthropology, hunter-gatherers to agriculture. And once they moved to agriculture, they needed to know when to plant the crops. So they needed to keep track of the seasons. And so they needed to keep track of the stars. And so they would begin to build big, immovable structures to observe the stars. Stonehenge, ziggurats, pyramids, Cahokia Mounds, all these different big structures, immovable, and they all had something to do with looking at the stars. And then somebody got to climb up the building, look at the stars, and come down with the secret knowledge from heaven as to when to plant the barley (laughs) and when to plant the oats, you know, because they had different growing seasons and they wanted to get it after the last spring, you know, flooding and before the, the fall frost. And, and so you see these 
But once they moved to agriculture, they wanted to build these buildings so that they could look at the stars. And, and then the person would come down from this building, and there's, there would, they would claim to be an intermediary between the heavens above and all these common people down below. And before you know it, it went to their head. And you had these Babylonian Assyrian kings were king priests. And the Egyptian pharaohs were son of the god Osiris. And the Roman emperors, uh, as the cult of the deified August Caesar, they demanded their image be worshipped as a god. Chinese emperors claimed they had a mandate from heaven to rule. Inca emperors claimed to be delegates of the sun god. A Muslim caliphs claimed to be successors of the messenger of Allah. In India, they had the rajas, which were a semi-divine caste of rulers. The Japanese emperors, heavenly sovereigns. And then they Christianized it in Europe and called it the divine right of kings. God chose me to be the king, the intermediary. And so whatever my will is must be God's will because he put me here. So I can pretty well do anything I want. And if you're challenging me, you're challenging God and I can crush you. <laughs> And so this divine right of kings was what we saw. The creator gives the power to this one guy, and he gives it to these lowly subjects. Here's King Louis XIV, the sun king, because his subjects were planets that revolved around him every day. He said, I am the state. Talk about an ego. And then one time his, admi his advisors said, King, you can't do this particular thing. It's illegal. He goes, it is legal because I wish it. It's like, okay, I get it. The laws are nothing more than the king's wishes, and he just happens to have a really powerful army to make you obey. Here's King James. Jamestown is named after him. He says, Kings are God's lieutenants upon earth, sit upon God's throne. The king is the overlord of the whole land, master over every person, having power over the life and death of everyone. Can you begin to see why America's founders wanted to break away from this guy? And so here's the British Empire at its biggest extent. It was a globalist empire. The King of England was a one-world government guy. He wanted to be at the top, and kings have subjects who are subjected to their will. Democracies and republics have citizens. The word citizen is Greek. It means co-sovereign, co-ruler, co-king. You're a citizen of America. You are a co-king of America. So America's founders took the king, and they flipped it. And if it wasn't for a 3,000-mile ocean, and if it wasn't for the Reformation and so forth, it would have never happened. So it took centuries before America was able to break from a king. And you have one of the signers of the Declaration, James Wilson, said, After a period of 6,000 years since creation, the United States exhibit to the world the first instance of a nation assembling voluntarily and deciding that system of government under which they should live. So he uses the number 6,000 and says something unique happened here. And then Daniel Webster said, miracles do not cluster. What has happened once in 6,000 years may not happen again. Hold on to the Constitution, for if the American Constitution should fail, there will be anarchy throughout the world. Why would there be anarchy throughout the world? Because for 6,000 years, people have been suffering under the thumbs of Pharaoh Caesars and Kaisers, and they thought, gee, if only we could rule ourselves without a king, wouldn't that be wonderful? And in America, we did it. And if we blow it, there's nothing left for humanity to look forward to this side of heaven. Then what? Chinese dictators, uh, Russian dictators, Iranian Ayatollah dictators, North Korean dictators. It's going to be a gang war on a global scale, right? America has been holding back this, <laughs> this antichrist spirit, right? Because we've been the people. Being, but once, once America's down, forget it. It's going to be back to this gang war, and then you got the, you know, the kings are going to give their power to the one, you know, the Antichrist, and for the, and, and there's, it's going to be a reconcentration of power globally, and it's going to happen super fast. Anyway, now, how did America come up, come about? Um, you have Romans, three centuries, persecute Christians, and Constantine stops the persecution. Next big one is Attila the Hun, scourging. And then he stopped. The next big one of attack is Islam. And they conquer uh, all of what used to be Christian. And so the Muslims conquered Jerusalem, which had been a Byzantine Christian city since Constantine. Uh, St. Helena, his mom, built all these cathedrals there. Uh, Syria was conquered by Caliph Umar. Syria was the first country that was completely Christian. 
evangelized by the Apostle Paul. And then the Muslims conquered into Armenia, which was completely Christian. And then the Muslims conquered into Egypt. People forget Egypt was Christian for six centuries. Evangelized by Mark that wrote the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, until Amir ibn Alas conquers it. And then there used to be 250 Catholic dioceses along North Africa. Right? St. Augustine of Hippo was from Carthage. Today that's Tunisia. The Christians had, had a movement sweep through called pietism that says if you're really Christian, you'll give away all your money and live in a cave as a hermit the rest of your life. <laughs> or join a monastery. It was like withdraw from society and just enjoy your own personal relationship with God. And the Christians, it was their version of separation of church and state. Right? We're not going to be involved. We're not going to be involved. So Islam just, boom, 10 years just swept through all of North Africa, and then they conquered into Spain. And um, the Spaniards were still fighting on foot with heavy metal swords. Muslims were on Arabian horses with stirrups. In 10 years, they conquered all of Spain. And um, then the Muslims invaded Rome in 846 AD, 11,000 Muslim pirates, and they sacked the Basilica of St. Peter's, and they trashed the bones of St. Peter and St. Paul. It was after that that Pope Leo decided to build the 39-foot wall around the Vatican. And, uh, and then the Turks convert to Islam, and they conquer into what is today Turkey. All seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation were wiped out by the Muslim Turks. And, uh, and then the, the Greeks beg the West for help. The West send help. It's called the Crusades. When they fail, they end. The Muslims conquer Constantinople in 1453. Constantinople was the biggest city in Europe. And it was Christian, and it was where the East and West met. And um, people forget a couple centuries before, you had Marco Polo go from Venice to Constantinople all the way over to China. Marco, remember the kids play the game, Marco Polo. And so when the Muslims conquered Central Asia and then sacked Constantinople, it cut off the land routes, and that's when Columbus set sail looking for a sea route. Columbus thought he made it to India, so he names the people he meets the Indians. Think of it. We never would have called Native Americans Indians had it not been for Islamic Jihad. Right? Why did Columbus call them Indians? Because he thought he was an Indian. Why was he trying to get to India in 1492? Because in 1453, the Muslims conquered Constantinople, cutting off the land routes to India. So, gee, we probably wouldn't have even had a state called Indiana. <laughs> Had it not been for Islamic Jihad, cutting off the land routes to the Indian side. Anyway, so the uh, Muslim Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent, uh, is controlling the uh, Ottoman Empire. And they enslave an estimated one to two million Europeans. There were whole Catholic orders in Europe called the Trinitarians that would ra ransom back your friend. And then they enslaved an estimated 180 million Africans. And then you had the King of Spain trying to stop the Muslims. And um, so these are the two most powerful kings on the planet, the King of Spain and the Muslim Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent. And in the middle of all this, the Reformation starts, Martin Luther. And then he has to have a trial before the King of Spain. So that's Charles V. He's 25 years old, and he calls it an argument among monks. You got one monk here, and you got a bunch of monks there. And um, he... Uh, let, takes um, Martin Luther out from under his protection. So Martin Luther's swept away, hidden in a castle, translates the Bible into German. Meanwhile, the Muslims are still conquering. And uh, Martin Luther says, the fight against the Turks must begin with repentance. We must reform our lives or we shall fight in vain our sins. If we're in God's wrath, so he just gives us into the hands of the devil and the Turk. So the king of Spain has two problems, a double dilemma, the Protestant Reformation on the inside of Europe and the Muslim invasion on the outside of, the, of Europe. And um, he tries to stop both for decades, tries to stop the Protestants, tries to stop the Islam, and can't. And so he finally decides to do a deal with the Protestants. It's called the Peace of Augsburg of 1555. And uh, you know how to say 1555 in German? 1555. <laughs> I took German in college. I thought it was... Anyway... So in this piece of Augsburg in 1555 is a little Latin phrase called uh, cuios regio eus religio, which means whose is the reign, his is the religion. So this allowed every king to decide what's going to be believed in his kingdom. This is the first treaty ever to recognize Protestants. And so um, they work together. Sometimes God lets the heat get on so that we have to work together. <laughs> and... Um, 
So in Europe, it was what the king believed. The kingdom had to believe. And if you didn't believe the way your particular king did, you were persecuted, you fled. And so you had northern Germany and Sweden were Lutheran, Switzerland Calvinist, Scotland Presbyterian, Holland Dutch Reformed, Greece was Greek Orthodox, Spain, Portugal, France, etc., Catholic. Russians invited the Mennonites over, and so they were, lived in a land between the Ottoman Turks and Russia, and, and then the England had Anglicans. And so Europe went from all being Catholic to thrown suddenly into this mass migration of people shifting from one country to another for conscience sake. And so it was one Christian denomination per country. If you didn't believe the way your king did, you were persecuted. So let's look at England. There was a king named Henry VIII. He was married to the daughter of the king of Spain. And after 18 years, she does not have a son. So he decides to divorce her. Uh, the Pope won't recognize the divorce because she is, after all, the daughter of the most powerful guy in the world. And so the Pope says no. And Henry says, you know what? I'm just going to make myself my own Pope. right? And then he marries Catherine uh, Anne Boleyn. And so here you have the King of England is the head of the Anglican Church, followed by the Archbishop of Canterbury and York and the bishops and deaneries and vicars and curates. And, and it's this hierarchical system. He goes on to have six wives. Their fates were divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. Henry VIII was not a nice guy to be married to. And um, his advisors came to him and said, King, if you're serious about breaking from Rome, you need to stop using the Latin Bible. Get yourself an English Bible. The German princes have Martin Luther's German Bible. That helped them to break away from Rome. You need an English Bible. He says, fine, get me one. Well, it just so happens a few years earlier, he had William Tyndall burnt at the stake for translating the Bible into English. William Tyndall's last words were, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. And now he wants an English Bible. So they take Tyndall's work, polish it up. They call it the Great Bible. And Henry orders a copy of it put in every church in England. This is the first time the common people in England can read the Bible in their own English language. And the king dusts his hands and says, that's it, we broke him from Rome, got our English Bible, but something unexpected happened. People began to read it. And began to compare what's in the Bible to this king divorcing and beheading his wives. And so a group starts that wants to purify the Church of England, and they're nicknamed the Puritans. And then the, the king doesn't think he needs purifying, he persecutes them. And there's another group that said it's beyond hope of purifying, we're going to separate ourselves, and they're called separatists or pilgrims. So we go from the most common form of government in world history is kings that keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and then we got this Reformation, and the king of Spain goes ahead and lets the Protestants believe what they want. So you got different kings in different kingdoms. We got England. The king says, okay, you got to believe what I tell you to believe, but now you got these, these pilgrims and these separatists. And, um, and in the middle of all this, um, when the separatists split away, they begin to look on how to have a government without a king. And so we're building up to America. And um, so a couple of instances. Uh, in 1571, uh, you have the, the Spain stops the Muslims on the Mediterranean with the Battle of Lepanto, biggest batter, battle ever on the Mediterranean. But rather than following up the victory with freeing the Mediterranean from the Muslim Turks, Spain decides to send its military to crush the Reformation in Holland and in England. So in 1752, Spain sends the Iron Duke of Alba to commit the Spanish fury in Antwerp, Holland, and kills tens of thousands of Protestants. Just leaves their bodies in the streets. And then the King of Spain sends his armada to stop the Reformation in England. And then in France, 15% of France is Protestant, and the Queen, Catherine de' Medici, uh, the husband dies, she's ruling France through the young son. Uh, she decides to marry her daughter to uh, the number one Protestant leader, Henry of Navarre. And it's a big wedding in Paris. A couple days after the wedding, she has them pull the chains across the streets so the carriages can't go out of town. And she sends her soldiers house to house, and they kill 30,000 Protestant leaders. It's called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. And they throw their bodies in the Seine River. And you have some uh, question as to what do we do with Romans 13, 
Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established, the authorities that exist have been established by God. You got, okay, we submit to the king, but what if the king is literally out to kill you <laughs> and kill your wife and kill your children? You're just supposed to say, okay, here they are. And so in the French-speaking area of Switzerland, you have a guy named John Calvin. And he begins to write things like, when kings disobey God, they automatically abdicate their worldly power. He says, he who does not make his reign subservient to divine glory acts not the part of a king but of a robber. We are subject to the men who rule over us, but subject only in the Lord. If they command anything against him, let us not pay the least regard to it. What's he talking about? Well, the Bible says children obey your parents. But what if there's a parent that tells his kid to sell themselves into prostitution and kill the neighbor? Is the kid supposed to do obey? No, the kid obeys the parent as long as the parent's telling them to do something that lines up with God's word. You obey the king, the government, as long as the government lines up with God's word. And if the government is pushing an agenda that doesn't line up with God's word, you don't obey. And, and so these Calvinist Puritans begin to develop this form of government where the people could rule themselves. And they got their ideas from the Bible. But what part of the Bible? That first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul. It's called the Hebrew Republic. And these Puritan scholars are called Christian Hebraists. And so suddenly you realize that when you study these 6,000 years of world history, kings, 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 bigger, 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 something stands out. It's ancient Israel. Around 1400 BC, they come out of Egypt. And for 400 years, no king. Everyone's equal before the law. And the law specifically said there's no respect of persons in judgment. So everybody's taught the law, and everybody obeys the law because they're personally accountable to God. I mean, it's a system that worked for 400 years. And so these Calvinist Puritans looked to the Bible as their authority, but they looked to the pre-King Saul period of the Bible. right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel. But... The people go to Samuel the prophet. They say, ah, this self-government system's not working. We want to be like the other countries. We want a king. Samuel anoints King Saul, and for the rest of Israel's history, they have a king. God still works his plan of redemption, but the people no longer rule themselves. And so King Saul is the divider between America and England. England, the kings look to the Bible for their authority, but they look to this anointed king, divine right of kings. I'm the chosen lieutenant in between God and these public, right? They look to the King Saul and on period. The colonial founders of America look to the pre-King Saul period. Millions of people, we rule ourselves because we're all taught the law and we all are accountable to God. So the king of England's attitude was, yes, you can read the Bible in your own language, but no, you still can't believe whatever you want. You gotta believe what I tell you to believe. And because uh, I'm the king. So you do not make up prayers because you couldn't make up a prayer that's wrong. So the government wrote all the prayers down, put them in a book. It's called the Book of Common Prayer. You feel in the mood to pray, you just open it to the right page and read the prayer. And if you're caught with a group making up your own prayers, the FBI will bust in, handcuff you, drag you to a hearing room. And uh, had stars on the ceiling, called, it was called the Star Chamber, sort of like a January 6th hearing room, you know. And. Um, <laughs> And they would twist your arm and brand you on the face as a heretic and, and make you confess to something you didn't do. And then they would throw you in a cell where they'd let you rot for days and weeks and months and years. Could you imagine the government doing something like that? And, um, and then they passed the Five Mile Act. If you're caught preaching within five miles of a town without getting approval of the government, they're going to arrest you and drag you to that star chamber. And then they had the Conventicle Act, came from the word covenant, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst, and the king didn't like you having small groups and because uh, you could be planning an insurrection. So they later changed the name of it to the Riot Act, and the police would bust into your little Bible study, put all a piece of paper, and read the Riot Act, which says everyone must immediately disperse or we're going to drag you to that star chamber and lock you away in a jail cell until you'll die. If somebody that was caught during this was John Bunyan. And he spent 12 years in jail. And that's when he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. So the king was banning these small group meetings. He even banned coffee houses. <laughs> right? So coffee came from Ethiopia, the one African country to stay Christian. And the Muslims called the Christians in Ethiopia coffers, which means infidel. And so the, since the bean came from there, they called it the coffer bean 
or the infidel bean. And, um, and then the Muslims are invading into Europe, and they're bringing their bags. Of, uh, and after the Battle of um, uh, Vienna, they uh, are, lose, and they leave their tents with their beans, and, and uh, they weren't sure if they should drink it. So they took a cup of it to Pope Clement, and he tasted it, said, this is too good to leave for the Muslims. Let's baptize it. And then coffee spread across Europe. <laughs> so have you had your cup of infidel today? <laughs> but it's OK to drink. Pope Clement said so. And um, so they had 3,000 coffee houses in England. People would gather together and talk bad about the king. And so he shut those down. And, um, not, and so we have um, uh, these different denominations starting. Uh, the Baptists were a congregational church that started at this time. And one of the Baptist founders, John Merton, was put in prison. They don't feed you in prison. And I obviously don't give you anything to write with. And so some f uh, friends sneak him a bottle of milk, but instead of a cork, had a wad of paper. And when the guard wasn't around, he unfolded the paper, took a splinter, dipped it in the milk, wrote out his pamphlets. Milk dries. It's clear. Folds it up, puts it in the empty bottle. Friend takes it home, unfolds it and holds it above a candle. And the heat of the candle turned the milk brown, and they could see what he wrote, types at the pamphlets and print them. So the early Baptist called the milk of the word, because <laughs> he wrote it in milk. And then one of the things he said is, no man ought to be persecuted for his religion. Another thing, the practices of Christ and his disciples teaches no such thing as compelling men by persecution and affliction to obey the gospel. Anyway, so you, you have more, but I, um, uh, William Penn spent eight months in the Tower of London. He said, force makes hypocrites, tis persuasion only that makes converts. And so that's when you have the um, pilgrims fleeing from England, going to the Netherlands, and then fleeing the Netherlands. They were going to go to Jamestown, get blown off course, land in Massachusetts. And that's when they, um, they were, the captain says, it's too dangerous to try to sail, and so get off the boat. And they say, who's going to be in charge? And um, they don't know, and so they decide, because uh, they don't have a king-appointed person in their group. So they decide to give themselves the authority to start a government, and it's called the Mayflower Compact. And uh, it says, we, in the presence of God, covenant, or, covenant ourselves to, together into a civil body politic. So you have a church group covenanting itself into a civil body politic. You have a church group forming itself into a political group. Now, why did they do that? To enact just and equal laws that shall be thought most meet or necessary, unto which we promise all due submission. Simple, revolutionary. It was a polarity change in the flow of power on planet Earth. Set a top-down rule by kings, it's bottom-up rule by we. In the womb of this Mayflower is conceived the child of self-government. Right? It's the difference between a dead pyramid, kings who rule through fear, and a living tree, bottom-up, where every root and every tiny capillary root sucks in nutrients to keep it alive. And so they got their idea for this from their pastor, John Robinson. And uh, that painting hangs in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. And so the, um, the pastors, it wasn't the hierarchical model where the king's in charge, and through he rules through all these bishops. It's a congregation model, where the pastor's job is to get everybody to have their own relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ that died on the cross for their sins, and then coach them to become mature Christians, read the Bible, pray, and then get them to plug into the body and do something. Nursery, children's church, junior high, because anything that's alive takes in and gives out. Any muscle to grow has to be exercised. That's why I hated the COVID response so much. Right? We all sort of felt something was wrong with that. Why? Because it said, look, change your church government back to this hierarchical model. You can hear a great sermon, but what are you going to do? Witness to your pillow? <laughs> right? Ministry takes place where you hear something, and then you put yourself in a position of giving out, right? loving and helping people and counseling and giving out you know, benevolence or whatever it is. So the pilgrims called it a covenant form of government. You get rights and blessings from God. You voluntarily share them with your neighbor because you're doing it as unto God. And um, John Winthrop, one of the founders, said, this love among Christians is a real thing, not imaginary. We are a company professing ourselves fellow members of Christ. We ought to account ourselves knit together by this bond of love. We must make one another's condition our own. Rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together. We shall find the God of Israel is among us. So we're taking this Israel model 400 years before King Saul, and we're making it the American model. That we're, it's not socialism where the government takes away your stuff and redistributes it to supporters. No, it's you get stuff from God and you voluntarily share it with your neighbor because you're doing it as unto God. And the king didn't like that. He liked the hierarchical model, and so he persecutes them. And then you have a great Puritan migration, and uh, 20,000 Puritans flood in to America. And you have pastors and churches founding cities. 
Pastor John Lothrop and his church founded Barnstable, Massachusetts. A Pastor Roger Williams and his church founded Providence, Rhode Island. A Pastor John Wheelwright and his church founded Exeter, New Hampshire. A Pastor Thomas Hooker and his church founded Hartford, Connecticut. This is unique on the planet. At a time when you have Russian czars, Chinese emperors, Indian maharajas, Muslim sultans, you have pastors and their churches founding cities. And so let's look at Thomas Hooker. He and his church found Hartford, Connecticut. After they get there, the church members come to him and say, Pastor, can you do a sermon on how we're supposed to set up our government? He gives a sermon in 1638 titled, The Foundation of Authority is Laid in the Free Consent of the People. This is reflected in our de declaration, government from the consent of the governed. And this is different from Europe because the kings of Europe could care less about your consent. And um, anyway, uh, Calvin Coolidge, Thomas Hooker of Connecticut, as early as 1638, said in a sermon before the general court, the foundation of authority is laid in the free consent of the people. And so his sermon's written down. It's called The Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, and it's used as the constitution for Connecticut from 1639 up until 1818. They're using the pastor's sermon. And that's why Connecticut's called the Constitution State. Here's a plaque in England, Thomas Hooker, founder of the state of Connecticut, father of American democracy. Another plaque, Thomas Hooker, Puritan clergyman, reputed father of American democracy. Statue of Thomas Hooker holding a Bible on the Capitol grounds in Hartford, the base leading his people through the wilderness he founded Hartford. On the site, he preached the sermon, which inspired the fundamental orders. It was the first written constitution that created a government. Another plaque, here ministered Thomas Hooker, peerless leader in New England thought and life in both church and state. Another plaque, Thomas Hooker, preacher, statesman, who based all civil authority on the free consent of the people. Another plaque. Uh, here preached his Thomas Hooker, his famous sermon, The Foundation of Authority is Laid in the Free Consent of the People. And then representatives adopted his sermon as the fundamental orders. What do they say? The people can join ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth. Who are the people? It's the church members. You have the church members forming themselves into a public state, right? A church group forming itself into a political group. Now, why did they do that? To preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And so another plaque, lots of plaques. This one says, Thomas Hooker's congregation established the form of government upon which the present Constitution of the United States is modeled. Our government was started as a church plant. America was started as a church plant. And so in New England, instead of separation of church and state, it was the pastors and their churches that created the state. How could you say, pastor, don't preach on politics, when it's his sermon that's their constitution? How could you say church members don't get involved in politics when all there was in Hartford was the church members? There were like no non-church members to be lazy. The word politics comes from the Greek word polis, which means city. Indianapolis, right? Politics is simply the business of the city, and all there was in the city of Hartford was the church. And so they had one building. It was called the Meeting House. That's where the pastor would teach the Bible, and that's where they would gather together and do their city business. The word synagogue means meeting house. That's where the rabbis would teach the Bible, and that's where they would get together and do their city business. Why build a separate building just to talk about a different topic? And so when the Revolutionary War starts, the British send over a military governor, Thomas Gage, and he outlaws meeting houses. He says, democracy is too prevalent in America. We don't need you meeting and deciding stuff, yet just obey government mandates. If the government mandates it, you just blindly obey whatever they tell you. Calvin Coolidge says, The principles which went into the Declaration of Independence are found in the sermons of the early colonial clergy. In order they might have freedom to express these thoughts and opportunities to put them into action, whole congregations with their pastors migrated to the colonies. So I read through every charter of every colony. Every colony was started by a different Christian denomination. Virginia was Anglican. Massachusetts was Puritan. Connecticut and New Hampshire were congregational. Rhode Island was Baptist. Uh, New York was originally New Netherlands, and it was Dutch Reformed. And uh, New, New Sweden turned into New Jersey and Delaware, and they were Swedish Lutheran. And then Maryland was founded by Catholics, and the Carolinas were founded by the Anglicans, and South Carolina split away, plain Protestant, Georgia Protestant, Pennsylvania Quaker. And they didn't get along. And they'd tar and feather each other. But then they had to work together against the King of England, very similar to the way the King of Spain had to work together with these Protestants to fight the Islamic invasion into Europe. And um, is this interesting? Yes. 
And um, now, uh, I, I, I usually look up and see a clock, but I see an exit sign. So, um, <laughs> so, so, so I got how many more minutes? Ten, oh, I thought I was going to get a 10-minute warning. Um, anyway, uh, so, um, so let's look at ancient Israel. And uh, the, um, what? So they looked to ancient Israel. Ancient Israel was the first place where everyone was equal because there was no king, no royal family. So Israel was the beginning of the concept of equality. They had tolerance. They were worshiping the one true God. They never felt compelled to force anybody to worship the one true God. Uh, ancient Israel was the first nation with private land ownership. You see, wherever there's a king, you never really own the land. It's always conditional of you staying on the nice side of the king. When the children of Israel entered the promised land, every family was given property. You own property, you can accumulate stuff. The Bible called that being blessed. You can give away some of your stuff. The Bible called that charity. Uh, ancient Israel, everyone was taught the law, including children. And then everybody helped enforce the law so they didn't have police. They didn't have a standing army because every man was in the militia armed with a sword upon their thigh and ready at a moment's notice to defend their family. Israel had no prisons, like Joseph was in prison in Egypt. In Israel, when there was a crime, you got the elders, you had the trial out the city gates, and then a city of refuge, bureaucracy, free welfare system. In Egypt, you need food. The government will give you food, but it's in exchange for your cattle and land. In Israel, when you harvested your field, you left the gleanings for the poor people. This way, the poor were taken care of in a decentralized manner. And then Israel got to choose their own leaders. Moses spake unto the children of Israel, How can I myself alone bear your burden, take you wise men and understanding, and known among your tribes, and I'll make them rulers over you? And so anyone could be raised up into leadership. Here's Gideon, here's Deborah, a woman, becomes a national leader, not because she's related to royalty. She just knows the law, she's honest, the reputation spreads. And so, um, so ancient Israel was the first nation that could read. And um, what would motivate you to follow the law? So all governments on this, one side you got total government with these kings, and they keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The opposite is no government, which would be anarchy. But for there to be order with no government, the people need to have virtue. And um, I liken it to downloading a behavioral app on your iPhone. All right? So the Levites were like the computer geeks that help you to get this app to tell you how to act. But the big question is, why would you follow it? What would motivate you to follow an internal moral? Israel had the key ingredient. There's a God who's watching everyone. He wants you to be fair. And he's going to hold you accountable in the future. You're about to steal. Nobody's around. Then you think, God's watching me. He wants me to be fair. He's going to hold me accountable. Maybe I should hesitate stealing. Create something in your head called the conscience. If everybody in the country believes this, you can maintain complete order with no police. Now, God knew that you would sin. And so once a year, they had the Day of Atonement. And everyone's sins in the country were forgiven. And they started the new year off with a clean slate. And obviously, that is foreshadowing Jesus. And so uh, I want to skip past this. We go through world history. The most common form of government is kings. America's founders flipped it, made the people the king. And, um, but I, I want to end with this one thought. And this is the, uh, the idea is we're the bride of Christ. And every romance novel builds up to a decision-making moment, a forsaking of all others and choosing the one. And it's almost like God is letting there be crises intentionally to push us to the place of making a decision. And some people are going to choose the all others. They're going to want to be liked and friended and followed. And others are going to say, I don't care about all, all others. All I care about is Jesus. You know, you think of it. Let's look at the big, big, big picture in my closing here. So in 2003, they focused the Hubble telescope on a spot in the sky where there was nothing. Size of a grain of sand, held between your fingers at arm's length against the night sky. Tiny spot, nothing there. After 11 days, they developed the images. And in that spot, um, they saw... 10,000 galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Space Field. This is the picture. This is not an artist's rendition. This is the furthest picture ever taken away from planet Earth. And every dot you see is a galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars. And um, light travels in waves. Now they got the James Webb Telescope looked at the same spot. And they saw light travels in waves, with blue being the shortest, fastest, red being the slowest, longest. They saw the red shift, which means these galaxies are moving away from us. They now estimate the observable universe is 93 billion light years across and still expanding at the speed of light. And the largest star they found is Stevenson 2-18, a super gas giant. So large, if you were to place it in our solar system, it would engulf the orbit of Saturn, the sixth planet from the sun. We're the third planet. 
Could you imagine one single star that enormous? That God made all of it, and he made you. Why would he make you? What could you offer a being that is that powerful? When you think of it, what, what's a galaxy anyway? It's a bunch of rocks, hot rocks, cold rocks, vaporized rocks, enormous rocks. A rock cannot love you. It's almost like at some time in eternity past, God said, been there, done that. I would really like someone in my image that could love me. Now it gets interesting because love by definition must be voluntary. The moment it's forced, it evaporates. So in this context of everything God controls, time, matter, space, energy, he created one little thing. He doesn't control your will. He could control it if he wanted to, but that would defeat the very reason he made you different than everything else. He doesn't need your love. He's not incomplete in some way, and your love somehow completes him. He didn't, doesn't need your love, but he wants it. Parents don't need the love of their children, but they want it. What's the most important thing in your life? Well, somewhere at the top of the list is loving and being loved. And if you're made in God's image, could it be that loving and being loved is important to him? And he loves everything he made, but could he be loved back? You know, I looked at the word angel in the King James Bible. It appears 289 times. Never once does it say the angels love God. They worship him. They glorify him. They praise him. They smite his enemies. They deliver his judgments. They deliver messages to Daniel and Mary. They are heavenly witnesses. They rejoice when a sinner converts. But the word love is not used in any verse in the Bible to describe an angel's relationship with God. They are, they are not made in God's image, and Jesus did not die on the cross for angels. They're mighty and powerful, and they're brilliant and intelligent. Right? But they were made for a purpose. What purpose were you made for? We're not very smart and we're not very intelligent. <laughs> Why would God make us? Well, guess what? The word love is used all throughout the Bible when it comes to men and women. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. Right? Jesus rises from the dead and says, Peter, do you love me? We are beings created with the ability to love God, but love by definition must be voluntary. The moment it's forced, it evaporates. The moment God would force you in any way to love him, he himself would know he's forcing you to love him, and he would know your response is not a love response. So he'll never force you. But the second thing is he has to hide himself behind his creation. Because if he ever reveals himself to you in all of his universe, creating omnipotent power, brighter than a trillion, trillion suns, your response, if you didn't melt, would be like the Apostle John, the book of Revelation, I fell at his feet, is dead. It would be an involuntary response. In the presence of all power? And God's like, I can do involuntary all, all eternity long. I'm interested in this voluntary thing. So he hides himself behind his creation. People say, if God's real, why doesn't he show himself? Because the moment he shows himself, your free will's gone. In the presence of such power? It's like a billionaire has a son who goes to college, flies in on his private jet, drives up in his Lamborghini, gold rings, Rolex watch, He's going to have every girl on campus wanting to meet him. But if he lays that aside, drives up in an old clunker, got holes in his jeans, the uppity girls are going to ignore him. But then there's a girl that likes to study with him in the library, and they eat together in the cafeteria, and they become friends. And she takes heat from the clique for hanging around this nobody guy. But she believes in him. They fall in love. They get engaged. And then he says, hey, I want to take you back to meet my dad. And they're like driving up to this castle mansion, and the girl's like, whoa, you didn't tell me about all this. He knows that she loves him for him, not because of all of his stuff. Jesus laid aside his glory and was born humbly in a major. He only wants those that love him for him. But there's a third thing, and it's the last thing. God is just, and he cannot help it, right? Which means he has to judge every sin. And so if he makes free will beings, hides himself so we have free will, but if we step out of line one time, he has to judge us. Because if he doesn't judge our sin, by default, he's giving consent to the sin. It's called the rule of tacit admission. We see it in wedding ceremonies. The pastor says, if you're silent, you're giving consent to the wedding. Speak now or forever, hold your peace. If there are sins going on and God is silent and not judging the sin, by default, he'd be giving consent to the sin. And if God gives consent to one sin, one time, he denies himself. He denies his just nature. He ungods himself. He's kicked out of heaven. And he is not going to get kicked out of heaven, and he is not going to deny himself, and he is going to judge every sin. So he could never be loved back, because if something steps out of line, he's got to judge it. So he came up with a plan, and the plan is his own son would become the lamb and take the judgment that we all deserve upon himself. So God is just in that he judges every sin. He's love in that he provided the lamb to take the judgment. So Abraham and Isaac are going to the top of Mount Moriah, 
And Isaac says, Father, we have the wood for the sacrifice. We have the coals for the sacrifice. But where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, Son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And it has a double meaning. Trust in God will have a ram up in the bush, but the other is God will provide himself. And that's what happened. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the only begotten Son of God, in the plan of redemption that was hidden from ages. It was a hidden plan. It says if the princes of this world had known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. The Apostle Paul calls it the mystery of the gospel. It was a hidden plan. Jesus came to earth, became a man, and only as a man could God hang on a cross and die for our sins. It says in Isaiah 53, it pleased the Lord to crush him. Charles Wesley wrote, Amazing love, how could it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? And you think, okay, God is just, and there's billions of us, and one of him, and we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all deserve eternal damnation. If God is just, how, how, does, how can one person pay for all of our sins? Jesus is divine, and he experienced that judgment from a, dim a dimension we'll never understand. It says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. He experienced that day on the cross as if it was a thousand years. You know, we read the book of Revelation, and I'm still trying to figure it out. That's why I love hearing all Tommy Ice and, the, and Don Perkins and the others. But one thing seems really clear in the book of Revelation. It's God that is pouring out the judgment. Right? The lamb breaks the seal. The angel throws the center. The angel blows the trumpet. It's God. Why is that? Well, this is the final judgment. God's a just God. He has to judge every sin. Because if he doesn't judge, he's giving consent. And if he gives consent to sin, he denies himself. So he has to judge every sin. But this is the final judgment, right? So there'll never have to be any more judging for the rest of eternity. But in that sense, Jesus had the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. He took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross. That's why he was sweating drops of blood. Experienced it as if it was a thousand years. And then when we're in Christ, that means that we're not going to go through the final judgment because it would be judging the same sin twice. And God's a just God, and he's not going to judge the same sin twice. So he judged all of our sin in Christ, and we are in Christ. Does that make sense? And so you think, well, how can one person... And he, So Jesus is divine, and I got a degree in accounting, so I like things that balance. You take an eternal being, Jesus, who's innocent, suffering for a finite, limited period of time, it's equal to all of us finite, limited beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Let me say that again. An eternal being who's innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, is equal to all of us finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Infinity times finite equals finite times infinity. An unlimited being, suffering for a limited period of time, is equal to all of us limited beings, suffering for an unlimited period of time. Jesus literally suffered the equivalent of eternal damnation in all of our places, and he is the only one who could have done it. And out of love for the Father and out of love for you and me, he became the Lamb. This way, you and I can approach this universe-creating, omnipotent, all-just God and not have to worry about being judged. The Lamb is his plan to love you without having to judge you. It's his plan. And then he fills us with the Holy Spirit. So instead of you doing good works, hoping to earn brownie points with God, you're already accepted by God, and it's the Holy Spirit doing the good works through you. Love the unlovable, rescue those unjustly sentenced to death, defend the defenses, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, right? And we get to be a part of his plan and spend the rest of eternity with God. Thank you so much. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. He's got lots of material back there, and uh, he's just such a prolific writer. And if you have a chance to get on Facebook to get his information or email, get it. He's got this one minute, uh, American minute, where he has. Every day, almost, he publishes something. Just a wealth of information. We'll see you back here about 1.30 or so, and uh, enjoy your lunch.